All right. Hey there, this is Bram Kanstein and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. Together with my guests on this podcast, I go on a journey to discover how our current financial system works, why it's flawed and why Bitcoin is the most relevant technology that our fellow millennials should understand and adopt. In this episode, I'm joined by Leon Van Koom. He's a professional in the real estate development sector and a prolific writer and thinker on Bitcoin real estate, philosophy, and ethics. He even wrote his master thesis of financial economics on Bitcoin, and it was titled A Qualitative Study of a Monetary Alternative, Its Value and Applications. He currently shares his thoughts uh, through his Substack and articles on Bitcoin Magazine, and I'm super excited to have him come on the show. Welcome, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. Well, thanks for coming on. I uh, I love your, your writings and your thoughts, and uh, I saw some other podcasts uh, appearances of you and i think uh like i i personally really like this kind of like philosophy angle thinking about bitcoin like i, I it's just so much more than a technology and i think you have a lot of like good thoughts um on that so uh, yeah i'm excited to to chat with you man i i just wanted to do a quick check are you a millennial too oh yeah i am yeah i'm born in 91 so Oh, wow. Okay, cool. Well, do you also see that it's like hard to help millennials understand Bitcoin? <laughs> like totally. that's the reason why I started this podcast, of course. Totally. I had a conversation yesterday with a good friend of mine and we said, you know, for there's this almost like lost generation, like the millennials that uh, people that have born, that are born, let's say, I don't know, people under 30, they naturally sort of grow up with Bitcoin. So it's it's almost part of their... Um, it's not part of their identity, but they don't necessarily question Bitcoin because it's a technology that's already there. Like the internet was for us. Like we grew up with the internet. Mm -hmm. We don't question it. It naturally grew on us. And the millennials and also people that are a little bit older, they are in between the internet and Bitcoin. And some of them have a difficult time understanding Bitcoin. It's, it's interesting. Do you think they like do understand the internet like now that it's actually like here and everywhere but but especially for like millennials i really feel like we never got any education on however you know this stuff works right mm -hmm. like we i mean you're also from a western european country right I, I also said this before like we just grew up in the best time ever of everyone who ever lived right and there were no problems there was just money and it worked right so there's also not really an urgency to to understand i think yeah there's a lack of necessity i had a conversation with someone and very smart guy um and he said to me leon i i've been following what you've been saying about bitcoin for a long time but to be honest with you i don't see the necessity like you mm -hmm. said of bitcoin i have a credit card I can go to my, the ATM, I can get cash, I can make a transaction to another European bank account within an hour and don't pay any fees. But the world has changed. Uh, Europe, neither Europe or North America in the center of the global economic hub. So the necessity for Bitcoin um, comes from Western, uh, Western Asia, South Asia, Africa, Latin America, all these parts in the world that were excluded from the global financial system so far. And there was no ability for them to either store value or transact value. So mm -hmm. I think adoption of Bitcoin, of course, also will be driven by these large financial players that are now entering the market and they will make Bitcoin part of their products. But it will be also largely driven by the global south. It will completely change the power dynamic. And I believe it's interesting because you see like 100 or 150 years ago in the Industrial Revolution, a lot of the aristocracy that were wealthy because they owned land, they missed the leap into, uh, into the industrialized uh, future, so to say. Mm -hmm. A lot of the people that have made money in the industrialized world, in Europe, they already missed the leap into the internet. In Germany, there's only one company that's listed on the NASDAQ, that it's a technology company, that's SAP. Other than that, there's no German company that I know of that has any significance in the digital world. So they already missed the internet and now they're missing Bitcoin as well. And yeah. the problem with that is that Bitcoin, the way that I see Bitcoin, I mean, it's a very versatile asset, but essentially it's money and it's, it's a battery which we can use to store productivity as a company or as an individual. And as more individuals and as more companies start to adopt Bitcoin to store their productivity, whoever does not own Bitcoin does not participate in the increase of productivity of all these global pay players. 
Yeah, I love that. Like it's such a like turnaround thinking in a sense. And I love the aristocracy example. And, and I feel it's currently the same, right? Like, okay, I have something. I don't really have a problem because other people don't have what I have. Whatever is happening it, like over there to, you know, make their life better. I don't really have to be a part of it because my life is already fine. Mm. Right. But it's kind of like this, uh, this ignorance towards thinking. It's actually very kind of like, um, how do you say that? Like a conservative thinking, right? Like as if the world stays like it is and you mm. don't have to continue to, to change. Right. And, and I also think it's, it's interesting that like global South will probably prosper more from this than, than the countries that currently, uh, well, let's say rule the world, right? Like the, the Western countries, like in, in, in several ways. Uh, yeah, I, I actually, well, we are part of this Western world, so maybe we'll have like the, the short end of the stick of that. But I, I love that irony in a sense, right? Like yeah. it, it feels like really natural and logical that, uh, yeah, that's going to happen. Like, what do you think about that? I totally agree with you. It's almost like Bitcoin is this equalizer. The monetary system has been also used to suppress certain regions of the world mm -hmm. and extract productivity from these regions. I mean, the fiat system, by the production of money, the state absorbs productivity of the market. And it doesn't just happen within a market, it also happens on a global scale. The French, for example, they use the monetary system in the old colonies to um, to to decide over the uh, economic um, potential of these countries. So yeah. Bitcoin is this equalizer that comes in. It levels out the playing field. There's these amazing people from all over the world. Suddenly they can use Bitcoin to get paid. They can use the internet to find a job. And it just creates a, a fair um, economy where if you, it's really proof of work. If you put in the work, Bitcoin allows you to flourish. Yeah. No matter where you live, as long as you have an internet connection, it's amazing. And to to keep the the the, the fruits of that labor actually protected in time, right? Like exactly. that is, I think, the essence what it's about. If we unwrap this uh, like monetary influence of a, of a government on a country, uh, whether it's like our own country or, as you say, like a colony, like you see that in uh, uh, Niger, right, where they want uh, the French uh, out. It's actually interesting that in Niger, they still have the, the, the French francs, where France has the euro, right? So, so in Niger, they have the old currency of France that France doesn't even use anymore. Um, but I think your point there is, right, and, and you can extrapolate that to, to any country, you know, with a fiat uh, money system, that the government decides what, what the papers and the coins are worth. Right. Mm -hmm. So if if the work stays static, like people do the same work, like they are a farmer or whatever. Right. Like that energy that they put in and produce, like that's a that's a constant. Right. But the worth of the money is, you know, let's say it goes up and down over time. It all it all goes down. Is that like the unfair thing that 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 you talk about? Yes, 100 percent. I think very few millennials because of what you said, I mean, the last 40, 50 years, because of the credit expansion, on the 15th of August, 1971, we Bitcoiners know this, Richard Nixon, the US president, decoupled the gold from the dollar. And since then, we have living under fiat standard with no monetary uh, base. And credit expansion has caused a boom based on credit and the Western world. So people believe that the economy is doing well. But actually, if you think about how bad we are able to store value, we are actually living under financial oppression because what money essentially is, it's a way to save our time. We use our time to work and we use money to store the productivity we've created. And if through inflation money loses value, we lose the time we used to make that money. So the problem is, I think that we are not aware of the disastrous monetary system we live under. And Bitcoin also shows how the political and the financial system works and the harm it inflicts. So, because when I got into Bitcoin, I'll be very honest with you, and also for the per first four to five years of my Bitcoin journey, I personally was not aware of the state of our financial system. 
I didn't even know what fiat money was. And I studied economics, you know, I studied, I did my master's yeah. in economics, and I had no idea what money is until I wrote my master's thesis about Bitcoin because nobody in school really taught me what money is. I was told money is a product of the state, of the government, which it is not. Money naturally is a product of the market that we use as a medium of exchange. And then there's certain monetary properties, most importantly, the store of value function yeah. of money which leads to people accept, accepting money because nobody would accept money today that loses value in the future other than being programmed, which we are in school and universities under the fiat system. And Bitcoin allows us to deprogram ourselves. And it's money. It's funny, right? Because uh, uh, I think like your story is, is, is even a bit worse, I think, than me as being like un, unknowing. I, I said this in other episodes, like I was 30, I was working at a bank, I had a mortgage. Then someone explained to me that the money in the bank wasn't mine. And I was like, what? And then I understood and I thought like, oh, I'm such an idiot. Like I'm participating in the system, but I just have no clue. Right. So I think we are, we are, we are similar there, but also when, when people say money, you know, people think about the, 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 the paper and the coins, but that is the currency, right? And the, and yeah. the money is actually kind of like what, what should be the underlaying, well, I hear people say technology, or let's, let's call it a, a, a vehicle through which we exchange value, right? You do something for me. I necessarily, I, I don't have to do something for you now. We are not bartering, right? So I have to give you something that represents um, the value that, that you delivered to me. Right. And, and so when I think you talk about money, you mean that, right, that technology to exchange that information. And I think that's kind of like the first thing that people need to understand that you, you were not talking about the coins or the numbers on the bank account. Right. Exactly. I'm not talking about a currency system a national currency, or anything like that. I'm talking about literally the base layer, which used to be gold in the past. Gold, you used to work as a base layer. But through the centralization of gold, it has become very easy to manipulate the currency and the money market. Um, because gold is so heavy, central banks came into existence to hoard the gold, which was used by the government to finance wars a lot. One of the first central banks that was founded, I think, in, 19, in 1694 was the Bank of England. King William was waging a war against France. At the time, he was running out of funds. Then he offered his population to bring in their gold. Central Bank of England was formed. They hoard the gold and they gave the English people permissionary notes. So the first paper currency that was linked to gold in a European country. We had a paper money in China before. There was the Sverige Riksbank, which was the central bank of Sweden. That was founded, I think, in 1668, but I'm not sure if the, the, the year is correct. So anyway, in the 1700s, these central banks came into existence really because aristocrats wanted to exercise complete control over money. And they hijacked basically gold. And paper money made the whole thing worse. So Bitcoin is a base layer on which different currencies then can be issued. I mean, we already have different protocols like Cashew or Fediment that allow people to, to issue e-cash based on Bitcoin. But Bitcoin as a base layer uh, allows a new monetary system um, to come into existence. And so if people don't understand what money is, um, but at the same time, the money is being debased, right? The value of the money goes down over time. Um, I think Safe Dino Moose talks about a lot about like the time value of money. But if we don't understand, if, if, if most people don't understand these things, what does it say about like the perception of of time, right? Like this, like short, short time preference and long time preference. If you're, if you're unaware of, well, that you're probably subconsciously have a, have a like short time preference, right? That's why people buy stupid stuff all the time. How, how, how can we change that? Or like, what, what would be your, your way of, of, of letting people understand that they are actually yeah subject of that? Yeah, that, that is a very good question. I personally work with a very specific analogy that has allowed me to, um, to grasp the potential of Bitcoin. I believe it's also something that a lot of millennials can relate to. Because essentially, what is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is mathematics, it's binary code, zero and ones, it's information that represents money. 
because money is information who owns what, right? That's mm -hmm. what money is. It's a database, which Bitcoin yeah. is. Bitcoin is a database. Bitcoin also, interestingly, um, is a revolution in accounting because in Mesopotamia and Babylon, the first sort of records that we had for numbers were inventories of temples, you know, where people said this temple has that much uh, cattle, for example. And that turned into numbers and also turned into language. So money and language is, are, are closely interrelated. And then in the Middle Ages in Italy, we had a double entry bookkeeping, bookkeeping. So we didn't just have the inventory, we also had the cost on the other side. Now Bitcoin comes along and Bitcoin has double entry bookkeeping, bookkeeping plus the state of the blockchain is communicated to the whole network. So now we have, we have a three. It's not, it's not single, not double. We have a three type of accounting system. That's really interesting, I think, about Bitcoin. But because money has been broken for so long, certain assets have taken on the role that money used to have in the past. And the store of value function of money and the collateral function of money. Because money is something that could be used as a medium of exchange. You can use it to store value. Use it, you can use it as a unit of accounting. And you can use it as collateral to lend against, to then invest. But the function of a store of value and the function of collateral has been taken over by real estate. Mm -hmm. So millennials, when I still talk to millennials, when they want to build wealth, they always talk about real estate being like this, this base layer of them building wealth because that's what people have done for the past 40, 50 years. But the problem is, us millennials, we have been priced out of real estate because real estate has become so expensive. So the analogy of Bitcoin being digital real estate, meaning Bitcoin is a pristine store value and Bitcoin is pristine collateral that you could potentially lend against, even though lending becomes less important under Bitcoin standard because we can just save Bitcoin, which serves as a store value by default. Yeah. And if everything else goes down in value, then obviously Bitcoin then goes up, right? Exactly. Yeah, okay. exactly. But it's still important to be able to lend against your Bitcoin, especially as the fiat system is slowly collapsing as inflation picks up. We need to be able to lend against our Bitcoin. So I use the analogy of Bitcoin being digital real estate to, to show to people the potential of Bitcoin. Because right now in real estate, we have about 330 trillion US dollars stored in real estate has become the number one store value of humanity, but it's actually a very bad store of value. It's expensive to maintain. It's easy to tax. It's easy to destroy and it's not portable. Yeah. There's not no, there's not no risk, right? There is yeah. risk, there's costs, anything. Like if you need to liquidate, you have to, uh, <laughs> like, it's hard to instantly liquidate a house, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And Bitcoin. You can liquidate easily. You can take it with you if you want to. If you live under a totalitarian, <clears throat> sorry, under a totalitarian system, you can take Bitcoin with you. It's mobile, it's portable. So for us millennials who have been priced out of real estate, you know, we shouldn't be sad about the fact we've been priced out of real estate. We should be happy about the fact that we can buy Bitcoin at a price that's very cheap and giving its long-term price trajectory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I like to work with that analogy because it helped me to understand the potential of Bitcoin. And when you and when you then talk about wealth, do you mean accumulating? Well, basically, you do work, right, with a job or a venture. You accumulate value, which we call money. And is wealth then the storage in time of that accumulation, or how how do you define wealth in that in that sense? Yeah, good question. Um, Bitcoin gives us the opportunity to store our productivity. As you mentioned, it's near perfect money. And wealth in that sense, I'd call freedom. Um, I wouldn't call wealth being rich or anything like that. Uh, this whole getting rich, like that's mm -hmm. all fear, you know. For me personally, wealth means having the time to do what I want and deciding how I want to live throughout my day. And in the fiat system, you need to work long hours, your money is worthless and everything becomes more expensive. If you own Bitcoin, you can store your productivity. Bitcoin is disinflationary. There's less Bitcoin over time because of the pristine monetary properties of Bitcoin, demand grows. So the price of Bitcoin grows. Bitcoin is deflationary, 
which allows you to increase your purchasing power over time. So I would define wealth as freedom. Yeah, I love that. I, I also um, once tweeted that I'm I'm actually in Bitcoin because I am risk averse. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that freedom, right? Um, I'm not sure who's, who said this. I think it was British HODL as well. Like, um, so as you said, you go to your work or you have to your job, you take risk in a sense, right? Because you work for a company that well, as a certain risk profile. Well, if you work for the government, there's not that much risk, or maybe now, <laughs> maybe now there is, but you, know, you, you take risk with your job or your venture, and then you earn that money. But because the money is um, um, debasing in its value, you have to take on more risk to mitigate that debasement, right? And that's why people invest or trade whatever you know mm. from whiskey to stocks to <laughs> watches nfts whatever, whatever they try um and i really align with what you said that freedom like i don't do that because i have bitcoin like i don't have to do that mm. i don't have to take on that as extra risk that extra anxiety uh that extra job basically i also uh, in my uh, my second ex episode of the podcast was with uh peter dunworth and he said like this is my job this is my full-time job mitigating the risk and and seeing how we can earn more it's my full-time job and i have other people who, who work for me right like who can do that as an individual like it's very hard but you're basically forced to do it because if you don't do it then you know every five years you you lose like i don't know what is it 30 percent of of your um of that what you own yeah it's totally crazy if you if you think about it bitcoin acts as an etf on global ingenuity if you own Bitcoin, you participate in everybody who uses Bitcoin to store their productivity. And it's the smartest and brightest and most innovative people in the whole world that are starting to use Bitcoin. So if you own Bitcoin, you participate in everybody in the world that uses Bitcoin to store value or to use it to transact value. So I personally went through the stage where I was, I was saving in Bitcoin, I was saving in ETFs, I was saving in gold, um, and I was saving in stocks. And over time, Bitcoin obviously outperformed all these other investments. And then I understood, you know, Leon, sell all these investments and just save in Bitcoin because Bitcoin is also not an investment. It's just a type of money that we can hold. Mm. And because it's such a good store value, it sort of allows us to keep our productivity plus participate in everybody else's productivity that I choose to, to save in Bitcoin. And it's had, it has made my life a lot easier. And I have become, like you probably as well, way more optimistic about the future. If I talk with my friends that do not own Bitcoin, they are generally speaking very pessimistic. Mm. Their outlook on the future is very pessimistic because they know they can hardly outperform inflation. And their family and friends or their parents, they were able to sort of keep pace with inflation through real estate, but real estate has become so expensive that they can't afford real estate. So they're mentally sort of kept in this cage of not knowing their way out. And obviously Bitcoin would be the solution, but for some people it's very difficult to grasp the potential of Bitcoin without going through this bull market. So maybe we need another bull market for the millennials to really understand the potential of Bitcoin. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I, I have the same. I live way more uh, frugal also, like I, I spend way less money. Like I, I don't know. I, I, I find a lot of stuff, like, I don't know, like I already have 20 pairs of shoes or something like I did that before, but you know, now I don't anymore. Like sometimes I kind of lurk on the Nike sneakers app and I think like, okay, those are dope shoes, but I'm not going to buy them. You know, like it's just, it's just a different way of thinking. And, and yeah, I think it, it makes me less like, like you said, like also anxious, more optimistic. And also it feels like I see more things. Like I see more, I almost want to say like, I see more nice things or something like I'm I, in general, just you, you see technology going, you see, um, I don't know, like I'm really into also art right now. Like, I don't know, like it's just, it, it opens your mind in a certain way because you close like another door, like a door of a room full of anxiety, I'd say. Yeah. And it's also, and I, and I wanted to see if you see that as the same, like when you got rid of all the stocks and stuff, like 
do you see it as like moving that value and saving it into Bitcoin and not buying Bitcoin? Is that how you see it as well? 100%. I see yeah. it as Bitcoin as a, for me, Bitcoin is a storage for yeah. my productivity. And um, through Bitcoin, I've also learned to focus. Bitcoin for me embodies focus. And through being able to focus on myself, to harness my energy, I have more energy I can store in Bitcoin. So to focus on oneself mm -hmm. and flourishing at Bitcoin, I think are closely interrelated. Yeah. Well, I, I think, yeah, well, that's almost, uh, I, I would also argue like a, like a philosophical thing, right? Like if you believe that we all have infinite energy inside us because there's infinite energy outside of us, right? If you can find a way to put that to work in the right way, you know, what, what, what works for you, because you also can use a technology that actually enables you to do that. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Like, I feel that the world would be a better place, you know, like if we all have that. A hundred percent. I mean, first of all, my Bitcoin story is a story of failures. Seriously, I've made so many, mis so much mistakes. Uh, multiple times I've thought about quitting. I always continued. Same. But, uh, <laughs> it's, it's really a story of failure. But when I learned about Bitcoin or when I, when I, when I saw somebody transacting in Bitcoin for the first time, that was almost like, there was there was a feeling inside of me intuitively it was like wow this is actually how how money should work mm -hmm. but because i was so deep into into the fiat system because i was a i was a student of of benjamin graham warren buffett stanley drunkmiller uh, ray dalio bill miller like all these great investors but bill miller has become a bitcoin maxi by now but drunk miller too Drunk Miller too, and right now you hold Bitcoin, but I think he's, he's maybe half, halfway there. <laughs> he's halfway there, exactly. Yeah. So I, I was a student of all the, all the, all these yeah. investors, and I was studying financial economics, and that sort of always took me away from trusting my intuition. So intuitively, I knew Bitcoin was correct, mm. but as I was absorbing the news and I had all these different opinions coming after me, I was doubting myself. So three years ago, you know, I ditched the t my TV. I don't consume the news. When I wake up in the morning, I meditate. Every time, seriously, every time I meditate, I become more comfortable in being a Bitcoiner. So I think that we should trust our intuition a little bit more and give less a damn about other people's opinions and about the news because it can hold us back from understanding Bitcoin and trusting our intuition. Mm -hmm. uh, man, I, like, I fully agree. For me, it's also, yeah, it's failures, unlearning, new learning, like challenging yourself and also... Uh, we talked about this before we we recorded, but it's kind of like when you do the work and I think everyone who's into Bitcoin says this, like you have to do the work, but like, what is the work? The work is just studying, like really it, for me, it's, I don't know if I reflect now, it's kind of like, you know, this, this, this stage in like high school where you like really have to study a lot, right. To do a test. And then like, I don't know, like it feels kind of like that. Right. Like you're constantly studying and like every day you're trying, you're trying to understand, okay, what don't I understand? What, what are new things that I need to know? And then also being confronted with, and I think you had the same, like these old beliefs or whatever you thought you knew, you know, like however you want to define it, like just how you're programmed, like, and not even in a bad way, but just like, this is the information that you got as a child when you grew up and this is how you think it works. Then you at different points understand that it doesn't work how you, how you think it works, you know, and that's, that's also like this very personal, uh, kind of like ego journey as well. Right. Like you run into your own incompetence in a sense. Absolutely. I had a, I wrote down a tweet that you tweeted out because I really liked it. Mm. You said the more and more I dive into the global financial rabbit hole, the more I realize that everything besides Bitcoin is actually a Ponzi. Yeah. <laughs> Because what happens is you have to swallow these bitter pills. You're like, mm -hmm. well, actually, this is what I've learned. That's not really true. And this is not really true. And this is not really true. But then also, um, we have to be very careful as Bitcoiners not to become arrogant. Because to be honest, that's what happened to me. I thought, you know, I understood the whole world once I figured out Bitcoin. But then I got completely wrecked in the bear market. And I just completely got like ego destroyed, you know. So an ego gets you destroyed in Bitcoin and we need to leave our fiat mindset behind. So first we have to swallow these bitter pills to learn that the fiat system is actually bad and things are not the way that we think they are. 
Yeah. Then we have to accept, just because we know that we are not better human beings than other humans, we have to let our ego really, you know, leave that. Well, we even have a bigger problem because now we, uh, well, we are on a podcast talking about it. We need to tell more people, right? So that's the new problem then. Yeah, they will come. Yeah. No, but I mean, like, we have a new problem. <laughs> so we have to ditch our ego, but we also have a new problem because, you know, you, you can be right, like we can be right, but... That that doesn't mean anything if other people don't agree. That is very true. Right? So so that's also what I think. And we talked about that off mic. Like for me and you have the same like hundred thousand dollars Bitcoin. For me is like a I'm right moment. And I'm just gonna celebrate <laughs> with myself. But that's like for me, that's like the moment where I just know that I really did enough work and that I actually understand what this is. Um, and then we go on to educate more people, but that's like, I, I do think we need that, right? Like this, I'm right moment because you're constantly, yeah, being pulled in different ways to, I don't know, like drop your belief or drop all the things that you now understand after you actually did the work, right? Like it's, it's a, yeah, it's a spiritual yeah. battle kind of. Yeah. I a hundred percent agree with you. Once the hundred K comes, uh, we'll be right. And it's good to be right when you're right. Yeah. And we again, we have to stay humble, not become arrogant. And Bitcoin is, I mean, every day for me is a journey. Literally, like th the things are never as I expect them to be. But the Bitcoin price, as we know, is very volatile. And that's a beautiful thing. And and the fiat system is all based around control. So within the fiat system, central banks, central institutions, they believe they can control the market. They can foresee the future and things like that. And that in itself is very arrogant because if you believe, if you look at the market, the market is made out of millions of people. And if a single individual like Jerome Paul or Christine Lagarde believes that they plus maybe a commission have more knowledge than millions of people, I mean, that is just completely crazy. Yeah, it doesn't make sense at it's all. It's also like, totally against how we know it works, right? Like even... Okay. Why does the internet work? Because it's a collective of people sharing information and therefore the, the most valuable information and initiatives and companies and whatever, like they, they come up, right? Exactly. Because, because there's a base layer of, well, hopefully, you know, a, a neutral base layer where everyone can participate and just con contribute in, in their own way. Um, so it's like a, it's like a, a level playing field in a sense, right? And with money, it's not. Yeah, but... Bitcoin, of course. I mean, Bitcoin really levels out the playing field. It puts the individual in the center. It's, it's. I mean, it's such a beautiful thing. It empowers everybody if they want to. It's, it's so amazing. I, I'm so thankful to seriously. I'm so thankful mm -hmm. to be alive, and I'm very thankful to be part of, of, of what is happening right well, now. That we can see this, right? Like uh, last week, I thought we. We can call each other in 20 years and still talk about this or 40 years and we can even still talk about this like that. That to me is just so fun. Yeah. Like just to see where this like we are going to see where this ends up at least partially. Right. And and we were there at the beginning. Like I, I absolutely love that. Another thought I had, which ties back to what we just talked about, about, you know, that it's funny that kind of like the more privileged Western countries are going to be. The, uh, well, the laggards here, mm -hmm. well, that's our assumption, right? Um, but also that, the, and, and so it's kind of ironic that they like have to learn last, right? They have the freedom to think about anything because they are the richest, but they don't. And that's why they become the laggards, right? Like, again, uh, very ironical. But when you just said, you know, the, the, the people who have this kind of like hubris, right? That they think they are better than other people. They are also the laggards in what we talked about, more like this personal, spiritual, psychological journey that that we have gone through and are still going through. I think when you when you are you know uh, in, into Bitcoin, but like they have to do that, they still have to do that work. And and just because, well, this is my assumption, but they are like this right now. You know, it's totally. I don't know, sometimes I feel like this is like a God complex, right? It's so weird that you even want to be in this situation where you decide what the value of money is for all, all these millions yeah. of people. Like, I, I don't know, I think it's so weird. But what I like is that they are going to be confronted with the fact that they were wrong. Like okay. we are going to be confronted with the, uh, that we are right. And then they'll be like, what the fuck do I have to do now? Like they have to do the work, right? Yeah. Uh, and yeah, and, and that's also 
what I love about Bitcoin. If they don't do the work and want to work with Bitcoin, Bitcoin will force them because it's ultimate transparency, right? So anyone, um, you know, your website uh, is called a system of rules. You know, that is what Bitcoin is, right? It's a system of rules and the rules are open for anyone to see and anyone can join and anyone can follow. If you want to fuck with the rules, you will be fucked with. And that, that I love because you, you, you will be forced to do the work once you think it's valuable. You still like everyone has to go through this. And even these people who are now in charge, who are messing up the money, <laughs> they will have to do it too. Oh yeah. hundred percent. The volatility of Bitcoin, it's. I mean, I don't know if beautiful is the right word, but in a sense, it is very beautiful. It is very spiritual because it is this ultimate ego killer. You know, I mean, we are all the same in front of Bitcoin almost. I think Michael Saylor, he recently <laughs> said in a podcast, he said, what is Bitcoin? It's, it's an asset. It's a network. It's a protocol. And it's an ideology. And some people have a problem with Bitcoin being an ideology because they think it's religious. But in a sense, it's just spiritual, you know, mm. and that's well, the fruit of an ideology, right? Like it's the, it's a yeah. consequence of a certain ideology. Yeah, Sorry. Con yeah. no, for sure. It's a, and also the way that Satoshi introduced Bitcoin to the world, it's essentially also the difference between Bitcoin and other currencies, cryptocurrency, if you want to call them cryptocurrencies, I don't like the word anyway, but we just call them altcoins or whatever. It's that Bitcoin has been this immaculation of this individual that has sort of has left his or her or their's ego behind to gift something to, through the world. And everybody else that tries to build something that competes with Bitcoin, of course they will lose, but they are, it's also, it, it is their ego that made them build this. Because if they mm -hmm. would not have that ego, they, yeah, would, they would have had Bitcoin, yeah. They would have been yeah, part of the Bitcoin story. Yes. So that's why I don't want to, I had, look, I had my learning phase. I also dealt with all types of blockchains. At the end of the day, I understood that Bitcoin is paramount for me. And something I also understood, and that's very important, good money always demonetizes bad money. So we had different types of money in history. And eventually we had rare metals that demonetized other metals. So we had gold and silver. Eventually gold demonetized silver and we had a gold standard. The only reason we have multiple currencies today is because we are forced by law to use them. So governments and central banks can control money and absorb productivity through inflation from the market. But in theory, the market tends to the best money and that money will be Bitcoin. And if you call it a utility token or you call it this or you call it that, at the end of the day, it's a medium of exchange and it is money and it has to compete against Bitcoin and will not be able to compete against Bitcoin over a period of two to three cycles. Surely altcoins go up in price against Bitcoin once they're launched, but then usually they crash in price. Even Ethereum, which obviously has a use case in the gaming world, because that's almost how I see it. Like Ethereum is sort of like this gaming thing or like gamified finance or whatever i don't know mm -hmm. how to be call it i personally don't want to be part of it but i understand why people want to be part of it because it's very, it's like the fiat system basically but also ethereum has lost value when it measured in bitcoin drastically so people should be aware i mean a lot of millennials that i talk to they always say oh yeah i've got 30 40 percent of my of my portfolio in, in bitcoin. ripple and no, no, like in Bitcoin, yeah, exactly. And the rest in like Ethereum and Ripple and like this and that. So they apply the fiat mindset where you have to diversify mm -hmm. in different assets because there's so much risk in each individual asset. But in Bitcoin, you don't need to diversify. Bitcoin is your savings account. That's your capital base. And if you want to, you can diversify out of Bitcoin into real estate. If you want to live and own Bitcoin for uh, real estate for its utility value, or you diversify into a startup that you invest in that you think is going to outperform Bitcoin, or you believe it's important to invest, for example, in lightning companies to support the ecosystem. But you don't need to diversify within crypto. There's no such thing as diversification in mm -hmm. crypto that does not exist. How would you explain the, that the volatility is not a risk? The, you... Actually, very good question, because when people say Bitcoin is uh, risky, they, they actually refer to the volatility. Yes. Right? The question is, what's your time horizon? You know, I mean, right now we are in a phase where it's going to take maybe multiple decades for us to get on a Bitcoin standard. It can be 10, 20, 30 years. We'll see. Right. Um, and within that time frame, the volatility of Bitcoin is only dangerous if you only use Bitcoin to save the fruits of your labor. But if you, for example, say you are a startup 
and you save five to 10% of your money in Bitcoin. And that is money that you don't need for payments or anything else or for investments. And you can keep the money that you stored in Bitcoin for up to 10 years. The volatility is not risky at all. If you, of course, store all your productivity in Bitcoin, the volatility is risky, but you need to learn how to work with the volatility. And then the volatility does not become risky because the real risk lies in the def default of fiat governments. When we talk about a risk-free rate under a fiat standard, we usually refer to a treasury. Why? The treasury, theoretically, through it's the... It's always paid. <laughs> Sorry? Right. It's always paid. Yeah, it's always paid. Theoretically, you know, the yield compensates for the loss of purchasing power that fiat money experiences due to monetary inflation. Plus, we believe that a sovereign country cannot default. But we know that is bullshit. The risk-free rate in Bitcoin is your Bitcoin and cold storage, right? Yes. And that is actually the risk-free rate of Bitcoin. And there's very little risk if you hold your Bitcoin in cold storage. And so when, when you talk to your millennial friends and they have this anxiety, they cannot get into real estate, they hear you talk about Bitcoin, but they still don't get into Bitcoin. Like wh what is the biggest mental hurdle that most people need to get over before, you know, there's, there's obviously all these different dimensions of Bitcoin with all these little threads that you could pull, right? Like all these little different topics and things. But what's, what, what do you think is like the biggest mental hurdle that, that people need to get over? Yeah, the, I, I maybe start with myself and then I uh, myself as an example. So the biggest hurdle for me was my ego. I had problems understanding that Bitcoin is a better store of value than real estate because I grew up around the real estate business. And that sort of also was part of my identity. So for me, it was my ego. That's number one. You have to, un you have to accept the fact that you're not right. Like Bitcoin just humbles you in that regard. Number two, we have to literally... We have to accept the fact that we've been possibly lied to and manipulated our whole life. Um, the school system has told us a lot of lies and um, we have come to believe that money is a product of the state and it's not. So there's a bitter pill that we need to swallow. We need to become self-responsible. We cannot rely on any third party because if you think about it, that's what the state takes advantage of. It takes advantage of the individual being afraid of taking self-responsibility. Mm -hmm. And when you go through kindergarten and school and university, you're never taught to, to make a decision. You are basically just taught to obey. So you need to become self-responsible. And I think that will allow you to, to get into Bitcoin. And sometimes pain is a good teacher. So you miss getting into Bitcoin. Bitcoin goes through a bull market. And then maybe people get in. Other people have the ego to then dismiss Bitcoin again once it goes to another bear mm -hmm. market. But uh, to be very honest with you, I also came to understand everybody's on their own journey and I cannot change people's mind. Most of my friends, most of my friends are into Bitcoin. Like because for the past years, if I tell you buy Bitcoin, it basically means I care for you. Yes, but I, know that I, have dude, I have exactly the same. I have texts to my friends in caps please buy one, please buy one. I love you. Please buy <laughs> buy one, please, at like 5K. And then like from from sweet to angry to sending heart emojis, like, I love you. Can you please do it? Like, just, bro, <laughs> come on. Man. Yeah, and, and, I have exactly the same. Yeah. I feel very altruistic, right? Like you just like, but it's also for me that really works me up. Like, don't you see, like, I'm giving this to you. <laughs> you know, like that. That's when, I, that's when I also had to understand I'm not responsible for somebody else. So that True. feeling I have, this urge of you need to buy Bitcoin, so, sometimes what I do now, I literally, I do nothing. I don't even send them my podcast anymore. I just concentrate on my own journey. The people around me that got it, I, I, I communicate with them. We give each other feedback. I have my group of also Bitcoiner friends I met through Bitcoin that we like, give each other comfort and, and harsh times and so forth. But I actually stopped feeding the urge of telling everybody to buy Bitcoin because I know it can be annoying also. Mm -hmm. And I need to also let go. I think that also in a way is maybe ego that we need, feel responsible for other people, but we all are responsible for ourselves. Yeah. First. 
Yeah, I don't know if I feel, I don't feel responsibility. It's more like this enthusiasm, kind of like, I see this thing and, and you know me for years, right? Like, you know that I'm a diligent, risk averse uh, person who likes to dive into, you know, rabbit holes and learn about stuff. Well, this is my conclusion, you know, but again, that's, I think it's fair. That's also kind of ego, right? Because then maybe I'm validating that what I just said. That that I'm actually that, but I already know that, right? Mm -hmm. So I I don't I don't need that validation. So yeah, it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting experience that I uh, I yeah I I'm just yeah I'm just really enthusiastic about it, and I just want other people to see in, as in to help them. But I agree with you. Like everyone has their own kind of path in this, right? Like I'm already happy that I orange built my girlfriend, and she's like totally into it. So that's great. Yeah. That's that's great. Um, I wanted to ask one more thing about it. It's, it's interesting, like, right? Like the, the words you use, you say like, oh, we've been possibly, we've been lied to, mm -hmm, controlled by the state. You know, like I, I talked with other people about this as well. Like uh, some people say inflation is theft and all these things. And in my experience, when I use these words or say these things that are not even, I don't feel it's like an opinion. Well, maybe inflation is theft is an opinion, but what you said, right? Like you are brought up in a certain way things are have been told to you some things are just not true like that's not even that's not an opinion it's just what it is right but those words sometimes sound really harsh for people in my yeah. experience right and that instantly gets them kind of like on the fence or that like it makes a conversation quite hard like well you recognize this but like how how do you how do you walk around this right yeah, it it totally does. Um, it tur it sets people off sometimes, but I believe I I just say what I think, and then it's it's about how somebody deals with what what I've said. Okay, so it's not in my I'm not it's not my responsibility to deal with people's feelings about how they deal with what I said. Um, but these things can sound very harsh. But there's one example that I take. So on fifteen sixteen. Copernicus, who mm -hmm. wrote a book about the quantitative theory of money. And Sigismund I, he was the king back then. There was a Pro Prussian uh, kingdom in Poland. And the king, Sigismund I, he issued new currency all the time. And he based the currency and expected the, the wealth of the nation to go up. And then he asked Copernicus, you know, why is that not happening? And he basically told him, and he came up with the quantitative theory of money. If you increase the quantity of money, individual units lose purchasing power and he wasn't listened to that's 500 years ago then on his deathbed he published a book that basically said that the earth is not in the center of the known universe but it's actually the sun so mm -hmm. he dismissed the geocentric model and he said it's a heliocentric model and then i think 60 70 years later galileo galilei came around and he actually saw because he had the first telescope he said what what um, copernicus said is actually true back then people wanted to kill burn and in jail galileo for what he said but he just yeah. observed reality mm -hmm. but the people were so when i talk about we've been lied to i don't talk about the conspiracy theory i just say there are certain beliefs that we have that are not true but some people take them for true and they make you believe these stories similar yeah. to how the church disagreed with Copernicus and Galileo when they came up with the heliocentric model of the world that says that the sun is in the center of the known universe. Yeah. So, so that's what I mean when I, when I use these words. And I believe, like you said, we are just observing what is happening. I'm not making anybody responsible. I even believe that somebody like Christine Lagarde she has such a big ego that she just wants her signature on a 50 euro piece of paper and takes into account that she basically destroys the lives of millions of people through inflation. That's her God complex. Um, I don't even know that she ever questioned her, her way of thinking. So it is in my responsibility to make people maybe reflect on the way. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, so what you just said about Lagarde, right? Like, some people might find that harsh, but it's, I think it's interesting because I agree that it's like from observation, right? Like if you are just observing from, well, then I'll, if I speak for myself, like someone from non-economic, non-finance background, nothing, right? So I 
I see myself as like, yeah, like I said, an invest, someone who, who researches stuff. And I, I try to like observe from like a neutral point of view, like some stuff in the money system just doesn't fucking work. Right. Mm -hmm. And then if you see someone like Lagarde, just talking in like one direction with like one message with the same thing all over that is uh totally not connected to what i see is not working mm -hmm. you know then you end up with that conclusion right because it's it it almost feels so basic i want to say you know like if you observe and you see something is going wrong especially about the money system right like the technology we use to exchange value with each other and make the world a better place and our lives right if if, if you go that way then if you hear her talk you think like you are you are lying or, you know or 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 you're blind one of the two i don't know and and but just like even now when i say this i know that people will think like oh yeah oh well bum thinks he, he knows it all or something but that is not I don't know. I, I, I want to share it as like an observation, right? I don't know if I'm right, but that is my observation in a sense. Does that make, does that make sense? Right? Like it's, it it's kind of, yeah. Like I, if I, I, um, uh, expect for people in that position to be smarter than me. And when I hear them talk and not address what I have found to be wrong in the system that they guard, then that is, yeah, that's a problem. I'd also, say. yeah, I mean, the beautiful thing is we also don't tell anyone you you have to use Bitcoin, like by law. You can use Bitcoin and Bitcoin has certain rules which you have to, it's, you, which you have to obey to if you want to use it, otherwise you get wrecked. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't force anybody to do it. And I think generally speaking, also if you look at Austrian economics, the school of thought that emerged in Austria through Karl Menger, who in 18, I think it was in 1871, he wrote uh, Grundsätze der Volkswirtschaftslehre, which was then translated into English as Principles of Economics. And then Ludwig von Mises in 1940 in German and then 1949 in, in, in English, he wrote Human Action, where he basically came up with praxeology, which is the science of human action. He, at the end of the book, he says, everything I wrote in this book might be true, it might be wrong. It's just an observation. It is just, mm. just an observation. That's it. And when I talk about Bitcoin, I observe the state of the world, but I leave myself the ability to be wrong. And I don't force everybody to do what I do and agree with me. I'm just giving a certain perspective. And I believe that this perspective, that's the perspective that you also have, it's based on mathematics rather than on decree or fiat. Yeah. And, and as your website is called, uh, uh, you know, like you, what, do you want to follow rules or do you want to follow rulers? Right. And, yeah. um, in one of my last conversations on the podcast, we agreed that, yeah, unfortunately we can probably not trust ourselves as in humans, right? Yeah. We, we have to force ourselves to adopt a set of rules that cannot be changed which will be ultimately transparent for forever and that that will actually help us to, um, yeah, create a, a better system. Right. But, but even that is, is like a very big thought I'd say, right. To mm -hmm. accept that, that we cannot trust ourselves because if, when we talk about someone like Lagarde and we say like, oh, or God complex or this or that, we also kind of say that, well, if I would be in this position, that position, I would never behave like that right that's also what what we're saying which feels nice but we don't know if it's true yeah right that's so, why I don't, I, yeah. I don't want to become for example when i was younger i was into politics like mainstream politics basically mm. and over time i understood i don't want to be part of that system it's also something jeff booth very eloquently and beautifully talks about and that also what algorithm is and what bitcoin essentially represents it's if, if there's a system that is based on centralized control, you can't change the system because the system is inherently broken. It's based on theft and deception. I don't want to be part of that system. So I want to dedicate all my energy, all my focus into Bitcoin, this new system yes. where everybody can live a life that they believe to be uh, a good life. Yeah. And so how, how do you see Bitcoin in the next decade? Like, is this going to become a currency or do you see the store value like really set in first? Like what's your, what's your idea? 
Yeah, I'm, I mean, Vijay Bojapati wrote this great piece um, in 2018 on, on Bitcoin becoming money. I forgot the name. Uh, I think it's called The Bullish Case for Bitcoin, Turn It to a Book. And he says, historically, um, also observing what, yes. how money came into existence, he says money started as a collectible, store of value, medium of exchange, or unit of account. <clears throat> or unit of account and then a medium of exchange. One or the other is three and four. And Bitcoin started as a collectible of some sorts in the cypherpunk community. Then it becomes a store of value, which we are experiencing right now. And it's also starting to be accepted as a medium of exchange. Bitcoin is different things for different people. For me, it's both a store of value and a medium of exchange and a unit of account, of course, because I use Bitcoin to store my productivity. I use Bitcoin to make payments internationally and in conferences and between my Bitcoin friends. So there's these circular Bitcoin economies. And I use Bitcoin as my unit of, of account. So everything I do, I measure against Bitcoin. If an investment is not able to outperform the deflation of Bitcoin, I only do it if I believe it to be a charitable action. For example, for me, investing in lightning startups is not a decision based on financial gain because I believe it will be very difficult for a company to outperform the deflation of Bitcoin in the next decade, but I do it to support the ecosystem. And what I believe what Bitcoin will do, um, it will it will move into becoming a medium of exchange in the Bitcoin community, you know, all these circular Bitcoin hubs in the, in the world, South Africa, South America. But by the global financial system, it will be adopted by store of value. Companies will adopt it on their balance sheet. ETFs will adopt it. You know, maybe there will be products where what Sailor also says, bonds and Bitcoin will be sort of merged. And then eventually Bitcoin will absorb the monetary premium that all these assets have accumulated under an inflationary monetary regime. And over time, Bitcoin will become this pristine store of value where most of the productivity in the world most likely will be stored in. And it will also be the base layer for different currencies being issued on Bitcoin. These might be national currencies. I can also see central banks and countries that have a free basic order adopting Bitcoin as a reserve asset. And that will also be private e-cash issued through, example, Fediment. So different communities in the world might um, issue their currency, where currency is a money, monetary system, and Bitcoin is the base layer of value within the economy that everything is based upon. Yeah. And when you say, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it will take back all this monetary premium of all these other assets that have gone up in value, right? Like real estate, I think is the, is the, is the best example as in like the uti utility value of a, mm -hmm. of a home is not different from 50 years ago, right? Does that also imply that these assets uh, will return to, to their actual value, right? Like a more representable value in that way? I believe so. Um, it's hard to say what the time frame will be, but especially housing. Bitcoin will make housing affordable again because of what you mentioned. Bitcoin will most likely absorb the monetary premium that real estate has accumulated. Plus owning Bitcoin makes everything cheaper over time. Deflation, right? Also yeah. construction, if you're a real estate company and if you use Bitcoin to store maintenance reserves, you will be able to modernize uh, property in the future and construction costs might become cheaper if you own Bitcoin as well. So I definitely believe that in the realm of housing, Bitcoin as uh, this ultimate store of value absorbing the monetary premium that houses have accumulated will make housing affordable. And that in itself is just a game changer. Yeah. And it will also defund the state because a lot of people and a lot of corporations, they use bonds to store value. So bonds, so real estate, of course, is the number one store of value for private individuals, but it's not a good store of value for corporates because it's not easy to liquidate. But if you own bonds, for example, or short-term treasuries or money market funds, um, you'll be able to store your value within the fiat realm um, effectively. And you also to liquidate if you need to change something on your balance sheet. And um, I believe that people will start using Bitcoin to store their productivity and that will defund the state, which is also mm -hmm. a very good thing. Yeah. All right. Last, last two questions. What's a common misconception about Bitcoin that you wish to debunk? Hmm. 
I mean, Bitcoin being bad for the environment, I think that is something that people already start to realize. People understand that Bitcoin can serve as this battery that we can use to monetize um, energy much better. It will give us the ability to have a certain base load that is especially important for renewables. And so um, Bitcoin will also allow uh, microgrids, especially in Africa, where there is no energy network. Bitcoin can be used and is used by specific companies to create microgrids that bring energy to everybody in the world. Because one of the misconceptions that the fiat system has installed in people's mind is that the usage of energy is bad. But actually, the usage of energy is very good. It's just a question, how do we use energy and what types of energy do we use? Bitcoin allows us to monetize energy much better and bring it to people around the world and raise the standard of living. I'll give you a very easy example. If you look at countries where the standard of living is high, people consume a lot of energy, light, mm -hmm. uh, heating your house, hospitals and all these types of things. They consume a lot of energy. So that's generally something that I'd like to see uh, debunked. That's a myth that I'm kind of sad about. But that is already happening. There's already people that understand that Bitcoin can help bring a high standard of living and energy to everybody in the world. Yeah. Well, even if you Google now how much uh, renewable energy uh, is powering Bitcoin, I think Google says 53 percent and uh, and the trend is going up, actually. And uh, it it seems like the Bitcoin industry will be the first carbon negative mm -hmm. uh, or, or a, a negative emission uh, industry in the world so uh yeah i'm also excited about that like for me that's also the biggest one i think obviously it's it's um uh, it's a topic of this time right so um it's just yeah one of the default things that that people uh, uh go against so yeah i love that you mentioned that all right so last question and i ask everyone the, the same question okay. what's a core belief you will never let go a core belief Trust my intuition. Bitcoin taught me to trust my intuition. And I'm very thankful for that. And I'll continue to do so. Awesome, man. Thanks so much. I uh, really enjoyed this, uh, this conversation. Where, uh, where can people find you on the internet? You and your thoughts. <laughs> yeah. Um, so at Leon Vancom on Twitter. Um, you can find my, you can subscribe if you like to my Substack, the Bitcoin newsletter. Um, a system of rules .com is the name of my website that I use to sort of um, list all my publications. I hopefully build a better website soon. And you can find my articles in Bitcoin Magazine. And if you're a German speaker, you can find the translations of my articles on EuropeanBitcoiners.com, which is a free and open source education platform that translates text from English into all European languages. I work voluntarily as a translator as well. And you can find some of my original articles, especially on Bitcoin and real estate, also on EuropeanBitcoiners.com. Awesome, man. Well, thanks again. And I see you in a few weeks in Amsterdam. So uh, that's fun. And uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's keep in touch and talk soon. Looking forward. Thank you cool. for inviting me. Cheers. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, it would be amazing if you could rate, review and subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice. It will help us educate more millennials on the importance of Bitcoin. You can follow and connect with me on Twitter. I'm Bramke, that's at B-R-A-M-K. And if you are or know someone who has an interesting perspective on Bitcoin that's worth sharing, hit me up. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for the next episode. Thanks for listening. Bye.